Stanley Krippner is a big deal. He's held faculty positions at multiple universities across the globe. He's a fellow in five divisions of the American Psychological Association. He's authored a plethora of fascinating books and has written over 1,200 scholarly articles, texts, papers, chapters, and publications. He's a pioneer in the study of consciousness, having conducted research for over 50 years in areas including dreams, hypnosis, and shamanism, with an emphasis on anomalous phenomena that seem to question widely held mainstream paradigms. So Stanley, to start us off, take me back to the beginning and tell me a little bit about your early life and your career. Well, you know, that spans almost 90 years. I was born on a farm in the state of Wisconsin, which is in the central part of the United States. I went to the University of Wisconsin at Northwestern University to get my degrees. I spent several years in special education, working with children with special needs. I've had two university stints, one at Kent State University in Ohio, mm. one at Saybrook University in California, and I spent 10 years doing dream research and parapsychological research at Maimonides Medical Center in Brooklyn, New York. There wow. you have it. There we go. Greatly summarized, you know. <laughs> That's one way to pack eighty years down into a down into a eight eight seconds. <laughs> how did you how did you first develop an interest in kind of psychic phenomena in in that sort of thing? Well, I suppose it goes back to my childhood. When I was about twelve years of age, I was very disappointed because my parents did not have enough money to buy a set of encyclopedia called the World Book. Mm -hmm. And so I had an aunt who was selling them, but she could not sell them for less than $100, which of course was a fortune back in the early 1940s. Yeah. And so I went to my room in, in, in tears, actually, and I thought, do I have any rich relatives I can borrow the money from? No, they're all poor. Oh, exception of my Uncle Max. He's not rich, but he's well-to-do. Maybe I can borrow money from him. Yeah. And then it flashes in my mind, no, he cannot help you. He just died. And as soon as I heard that inner voice, I heard a scream from downstairs and I came running downstairs and my mother was in church and your uncle Max just died. It was very sudden. He had not been in poor health. And so that incident got me interested in psychic phenomena. And then there was a radio show called The Amazing Dillinger. He was a mentalist, and he did amazing things on the radio or later on television, like giving details about members of the audience, even members of the radio audience, mm -hmm. predicting a headline two days in advance, various mentalism feats. Of course, it was all show business, all magic, but I didn't realize it at the time. And so when I got to the University of Wisconsin, I discovered that there was a scientific discipline to study such phenomena called parapsychology. Yeah. And so that is basically how I got interested in parapsychology. Wow. So you so you had first kind of first hand experience, direct experience, and, and went through the route because of that. Yes. Wow. I, I actually met the amazing Dillinger years later through a mutual friend. I, of course, never thought that I would actually meet him face to face back when I was uh, so young. Yeah. But uh, uh, the fact that he was doing all of this by sleight of hand and ledger domain was still very, very impressive. Mm. Yes. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think Darren Brown, I don't know if you're familiar with him, but he's a fantastic like illusionist, um, similar kind of thing, I imagine. So how did you first develop such an interest in dreams? I actually was recording my dreams at a very early age, uh, simply because they were interesting. Mm -hmm. And again, I 
did a lot of reading on that topic yeah. in popular psychology books. And then when I finally got to the University of Wisconsin, not only was parapsychology not mentioned in my classes, but dreams were only mentioned once. Our psychology professor said, well, you know, anybody that dreams in color is schizophrenic. <laughs> and my friends and I looked at each other. We all dreamed in color. Does that mean we're schizophrenic? <laughs> so we just didn't take that allegation seriously. Yeah. And it was not until much later in my graduate years that I had some formal education in dreams. And then when I was invited to be director of the dream laboratory to do parapsychological research with dreams, that was on the spot training. I had to learn a lot very, very quickly. Yeah. Yeah, I bet. Was that your first Psy kind of study experiment, the, the dream telepathy? No, it wasn't. I had previously done a study when I was at Kent State University working with children with uh, special needs. And I did a, a test, extrasensory perception, ESP test. Mm -hmm. I had them predict the order of a deck of cards with colorful designs on it. And then I also had them predict the same information, but with no designs, just the written word. Yeah. And all of this was done under very rigidly controlled conditions, so there could be no allegation of peaking because all of the card decks were uh, face down. I didn't even know the order myself. And when we did the statistics, we found out that there was a significant difference between the written word and the picture, favoring the picture. Mm -hmm. And so that was my first experiment, which I was able to get published. Yeah. And so I did have some idea about how to frame a parapsychological examination before I went to work in the dream laboratory. Yeah. Wow. And and with the the dream the dream experiments, then were you convinced by the results of that, or because I don't think they were maybe the strongest of all the psi experiments that have been done to date, but there was something there that that made you find it quite compelling. Well, I wouldn't say convinced. That would uh, indicate some sort of belief system, which I try to keep out of the picture. Mm -hmm. I simply look at the data and present the data. Yeah. And people could accept or reject it as they feel free. But our work at Maimonides Medical Center with the dreams took 10 years. And over that period of time, we actually published close to 100 articles in psychological and psychiatric journals. Wow. And so the work that we did, which was subsidized by generous donors, really made them happy because they could see that their money had been used to a good purpose. Now, just a few years ago, there was a massive survey done about all the experiments with dreams and ESP that had ever been attempted any place in the world, not only at our laboratory, but other laboratories. Mm -hmm. And coincidentally, there were exactly 50 well-designed experiments over the 50-year period. And the work we did at Maimonides got the highest scores, but not significantly higher. Work at other laboratories was just about as uh, significant as well. Yeah. So the article, which was published in the International Journal of Dream Research, noted that the replication rate for the dream ESP experiments was about what you'd expect from any other psychological experiment. So when people say that these effects are not replicable, they don't know what they're talking about. Mm. Our, our work with dreams and ESP was replicable. 
Other studies have been replicated. And of course, you don't get the same results every time, but you don't get the same results every time in any complicated psychological experiment. There are just yeah. too many variables going on. Yeah, absolutely. I recently read um, Dr. Dean Radin's uh, The Conscious Universe, the, the Scientific Truth of Psychic Phenomena, and your studies and your name, is it comes up in there quite a few times. And I thought that was fascinating. That shows just how, like you say, replicable these studies are, just how repeatable, testable, and how you can yeah take away the outliers and all that. kind. Of, it's basically a book of meta-analysis. I'm sure you're familiar with it. Um, so Stanley, at this point, after all the work you've done and, and everything that you've seen, all the research you've done, and, and I mean, it's a lot, right? There's a lot. What are your kind of thoughts and, and opinions on psychic phenomena in terms of its reality, its the, the capabilities of it and the potency of it? Like, uh, what are the, what's the potential with, with Psy? I would say that, uh, looking at the data, hearing about people's experiences, that what we in English call paranormal is actually normal. It's one variety of normal, ordinary experience. Mm -hmm. And we call it paranormal because it happens outside of what mainstream science thinks universes universally people are capable of doing or not doing. Yeah. So you go to a different culture, some indigenous cultures, and psychic phenomena are a part of their everyday life. They don't consider them paranormal at all. That's their normality. Mm -hmm. So it's only in countries that where the psychology is dominated by the standard Western paradigm that we have this problem with normal and paranormal. Now, I think that there's nothing wrong with Western science because it's Western science that's given, given us the tools to explore things like dream telepathy. Yeah, It's nothing wrong with sciences. The problem is the scientists. And the scientists who are so locked into a particular worldview that they simply do not pay attention to the evidence. Now, a few people over the years have examined the evidence, and I've had dialogues with them. Um, people like Ray Hyman in the United States mm -hmm. and Christopher French in England. And so they are aware of the evidence, and much to their credit, they say we cannot call parapsychology a pseudoscience. It uses scientific tools. It's just that we do not think that the evidence is convincing enough, but we still encourage experiments to be done. Yeah. Well, I think that that's a perfectly rational point of view. There are many things in life where well-informed people can simply say, well, the evidence isn't convincing, mm -hmm. but I am familiar with the evidence. Yeah. All right. Well, this is something that uh, uh, I can live with. Yeah. For example, there's a whole group of scientists who to this day don't think that the HIV virus causes AIDS. Uh, and of course, a couple of decades ago, people were dying right and left from AIDS, and there was great controversy over the uh, over the cause. And there are still, to this day, some well-informed people who take exception to that. Well, I think they're wrong, but at least I can dialogue with them. Also, there are some very well-informed people who don't believe that the humans are responsible for the climate change or global warming. Mm -hmm. They say, yes, global warming is happening, but human intervention is negligible. It's just part of a cycle. Yeah. Well, again, I think they're wrong, but we can dialogue because at least they have read the material and they have enough evidence on their own to back up their point of view so that we can have the dialogue. Yeah. So I'm just, there are many other, many, many other examples that I could use, but 
The whole point is you can't dialogue meaningful with somebody who has not read the material, has not been informed enough to have a good conversation with you about it. Yeah. So uh, the direct answer to your question is the paranormal is actually normal. And what we call anomalies today might be mainstream a few years from now. Yeah. Things change. Worldviews change. The more science brings evidence to the fore, more things change. And I've seen this in my lifetime. When I was a teenager, I looked at the globe of the world and did some cutouts, and I found that South America fit very nicely into Africa. At that time, no, this was just a coincidence. I didn't believe it. And then some years later, the theory of continental drift came up. Yes. Africa and South America were part of a large continent, and over the millennia, they drifted away. Well, so this is a major change that I have seen in my lifetime. More yeah. facts come in, and the scientific worldview changes. So as scientists, we just plug away, we do the best research we can do, and hope that it'll make an impact. Now, at the same time, we have a service, you probably have it too in France, called Wikipedia. Mm -hmm. And Wikipedia has a vendetta against anything in parapsychology. They consider it a pseudoscience. And you go to my web, my entry on Wikipedia, and they actually lie, not once but twice. First of all, they say that... Uh, the experiments are not replicable, replicable. And secondly, they say that people in our dream club at the experiments looked at the pictures before they went to sleep. No, both of those are lies. And friends of mine have tried to get the changes. The changes last for a few hours and then they're taken down. So I use this as an example. Wikipedia reaches millions of people. And those who look up my name We'll think, well, all that work with dream telepathy really didn't amount to anything. You know, if I had money, I would hire a lawyer and sue Wikipedia for damages. Mm. But they're powerful. They get away with things like that. And of course, there are people, colleagues of mine, who have suffered even worse than I have. So I can't complain too much. You mentioned Ray Hyman and, um, and Christopher French, I think. Yeah, it's two, yeah, they were very prominent skeptics, weren't they? They were people that were aware of the of the body of evidence, but like you say, they they would open in dialogue, but they weren't kind of they didn't have the same interpretations of it. But in general, you've had quite an open and, and good relationship with, I guess, different skeptics, um, debunkers, and I, and I think you like to call them scoffers as well, people that just don't even I, I suppose yeah. don't even look into the evidence and they just dismiss it. Um, how have you managed to always have that kind of keep that open, open communication, open dialogue? Oh, I even had, of course, Christopher French and Ray Hyman are still with us, but I had a good relationship with the amazing Randy, the magician who was hell bent on exposing fake healers and the like. Mm -hmm. Well, again, I don't agree with his take on parapsychology, but I think he provided a good service in terms of exposing so-called faith healers who were actually using mentalism and sleight of hand, the same thing that Dunninger used decades earlier, but Dunninger didn't charge people uh, for healing services, like the faith healers who now are making a great deal of money uh, and are not really doing healing at all. So. When Randy went after them, I thought, yes, that was fine. That's something we can communicate about. However, there are other people in that camp who I did not get along with uh, who have called me a charlatan and a faker and a pseudoscientist. No dialogues possible with them. Yeah. So I do what I can with people like Ray Hyman and Christopher French and the amazing Randy, that I could at least have a dialogue with. Yeah. And also, I should mention Richard Wiseman in, in England, 
who was an arch skeptic, but he and I have been able to have a dialogue, and there are others too. Yeah, I think it's so important that you had that dialogue, and it's, it speaks highly of you. Um, you mentioned that they they accepted that parapsychology was not a pseudoscience. Um, what would you say to people that think it is, that kind of read it on Wikipedia and just believe it and take it to the bank? What would you say to those people? Well, I would say, well, how you define science? Parapsychologists use all of the standard psychological procedures, even going further. Mm -hmm. Parapsychological experiments now can be registered at the University of Edinburgh. And so that when you do the experiment, you do not deviate from what you claim that you set out to do. This has been an arch arguing point by some of the scoffers who say, well, they change the design halfway through the experiment and get the results that favor them. I don't think that's valid, but now with pre-registration, they can't even claim that. Yeah. The most recent parapsychological experiment I did was with remote viewing. And we pre-registered all of that at the University of Edinburgh. So when the results came out, one cannot say that we uh, deviate what we claim to do. The results were very interesting because when people are doing remote viewing of uh, actually of, of photographs and pictures, the more interesting and emotionally involving and luminous the picture was, the higher the score. Well, we had predicted this in our research protocol. And so when that was published, you can't say that we were cherry picking and just picking the results that favored us. No, all of the procedure had been registered years, years before. Yeah. So I think that the pre-registration that's going on now is a very effective argument against the so-called pseudo-scientist claim. In fact, one can always turn the table around and say, well, these are pseudo-critics, mm. pseudo-skeptics. They're yeah. not really skeptical in the best sense of the word. They're not really critical in the best sense of the word. So they're the pseudos, not us. Yeah, that's true. Like you said earlier, you have to be aware of the, the full body of evidence before yeah, tearing it apart or trying to tear it apart or what have you. Um, before I before I jumped into this call with you, one of my one of my friends mentioned that you were you witnessed along with I think Janet Mitchell, you witnessed the 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 famous psychic Ingo Swan um, remote viewing of Mars. Yes. Can you tell me a little bit about that? Like what that that experience? Well, I will have to inform your viewers first of all who Ingo Swan was. That would be great. Uh, Thank you. He was a prominent, what we call a psychic claimant. We use the word claimant so that we don't have any prejudged opinion. Somebody yeah. who claims to be a psychic. Got you. So he was a well-known psychic claimant, and he volunteered for many, many parapsychological tests. He was the one who actually coined the term remote viewing. And he did remote viewing for a number of different laboratories. No, I never had a chance to do parapsychological work with him uh, because we were doing the dream research and that was not his forte. But he did invite me and my wife to sit in on his attempt to have an out-of-body experience and visit Mars. And so it was very interesting to see him in action because he had a little tiny cigar that he puffed on every now and then as if the nicotine would help his acumen and help him focus. Mm -hmm. And so when he was doing an out-of-body experience in, in Mars, he would talk about what he saw, it was all tape recorded, just as if he was there on the spot. Very interesting. And I'm not claiming that there was any new material that came out of that. He was much more successful when he did an out-of-body experience with Jupiter and detected satellites on Jupiter that I think were somewhat 
in advance of the astronomer's discovery of the satellites. So natural session, satellites. Pardon me? Natural satellites, do you mean? Yeah, so Yeah, so carry on. Mm -hmm. Um Ingo Swan was a very, very talented artist, and his paintings are are still very beautiful. When I visited him in his laboratory studio in New York City, he was working on several huge paintings, and he did get most of them finished, if not all of them finished before he passed on. Very, very great loss. And I uh, still am very moved emotionally when I talk about him mm -hmm. because he left the world all too soon. He was also a very good novelist. He wrote a good novel called To Kiss the Earth Goodbye. He wrote a novel about how you could use psychic uh, satellites in warfare, uh, artist, and psychic claimant, and author, and rock on tour. He was fascinating just to listen to. So that's it. And, and there's a wonderful book by Ingo Swan that I wrote an introduction to. So people that want to know more about him, yes, there's a lot of material available, right? Yeah, yeah, wow. Yeah, he sounds incredible. Um, you call him a, a claimant, but from all of your work with him and your knowledge of him, do you, do you think that he genuinely had these abilities? Well, he certainly got high scores on the tests that other investigators had done. Uh, Gertrude Schmeidler, who was a very prominent parapsychologist, actually had him identify the contents of a secret vault. And she didn't even know the contents of it. It was a government uh, structure. Mm -hmm. And he identified what was going on. It was a measure of underground activity. He was right. The government got very upset because they thought that he must have had allies that fed him the information. Mm. Of course, he didn't. So, um, so he did a number of, of uh, shall we say, remote viewing experiments that I think stand up as being very impressive. Wow. Yeah. Good answer. Before we move on from Ingo, I just wanted to ask, uh, what did he say he saw on Mars? Did he just report rocks and things like that? Or what did he say? Well, that's all in the transcript. I don't remember everything that he said, but yeah. I do remember him describing the landscape. Uh, and again, it was accurate, but we already knew what the landscape was when he had the experience. Mm -hmm. And he was asked if there was life on Mars. And he said something to the effect, not right now, but there was life in the past. And that life in the past might still be potentially viable. Yeah. Wow. And so time will tell if that was an accurate statement or not. Yeah. Well, they do believe there's a good chance there's microbial life, and I guess that could be a sign of, of potentially past life as well. That's um, a very, very good point. Very good point, because I remember Ingo making the statement, today there are things on Mars, they're not really alive, they're not really dead, they're in between. Well, that's exactly what a microbe is. Yeah, wow. It's, it, you can argue whether a microbe is actually a living organism or a non-living organism, and it's sort of in between, just as Ingo predicted. Got you. Yeah, that's fascinating. Well, we might find out about that very soon, indeed, and I hope we do. Um, what do you think? Um, again, I know these these questions you could answer long, long answers, but if you want to summarize, that's that's perfect. Um, I know we don't have all day. So, what do you think needs to change in the mainstream um, for for this phenomena to be accepted and to be able to be discussed more openly and and studied more openly? What needs to be changed is the proclivity 
of people who are hostile to parapsychology to use misinformation techniques. Mm -hmm. Again, I have no problems with people like Christopher French and Ray Hyman who stick to the facts. What needs to be changed is that other people who consider themselves skeptics to take the same position that French and Hyman take. Yes, parapsychology is a science, it's not a suicide, pseudoscience. It's just that we do not think the evidence is convincing enough. Of course, all of us have our own standards of evidence, and they're welcome to have their standards. And as long as their standards are based on data, I can dialogue with them, even though I don't agree with them. So what needs to be changed is that scientists need to adhere to science, not to their prejudices. Yeah. And science has an open mind, right? Science will follow the evidence. Good follow science. the evidence. That's what I keep saying. There was a famous saying in an American movie with Tom Cruise, follow the money. Mm. Yeah. And uh, follow the money was also used in the Watergate scandal where mm. Deep Throat, who was a retired FBI agent, told the investor, you follow the money. You follow the money and you will find out what was going on in the Nixon White House. So I say follow the evidence. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Follow the money can probably be applied to a lot of things these days, but yeah, follow the evidence. Follow the evidence. Oh, it's, it's follow the money, <laughs> especially in the political scandals of the United States right now. Yeah. To a, to a depressing extent, indeed. Um, mm -hmm. Stanley, do you see structures in physics that can explain or otherwise provide a vehicle for the things that you've observed in psychology and parapsychology? Well, of course, I'm not a physicist. And so I don't speak from that perspective. All that I can say is over the years, I've certainly worked with a number of physicists mm -hmm. who are convinced that the parapsychological phenomena are real and that they can be explained by their own interpretation of quantum physics, quantum mechanics. Of course, this is debatable among physicists I would say that most physicists uh, have no interest in parapsychology. Those who do, and I have dialogue with, have some very interesting speculations on how quantum physics can explain parapsychological effects. And of course, one of the most interesting, you might even say radical positions that some physicists come up with, and also other people too, is that consciousness is fundamental in the universe. It's not that the brains produce consciousness, consciousness produce the brains and everything else. That there is a whole sea of consciousness that is the matrix for how we are living and everything derives from consciousness itself. So this is a pretty radical point of view, but there are now a couple of excellent books. Uh, I don't know if they're translated into French or not, but they lay the uh, lay out the case for consciousness being fundamental, and they even quote some of the renowned physicists of all time, like Niels Bohr, who made the same statement. Yeah, you just engaged in a little bit of precognition there, because you've just answered my next question as well as the the current one. Um, I was just about to ask you for your thoughts on consciousness and whether you think it might be a product of the brain or whether you believe there's a good chance that it is kind of non-local. Um, but yeah, you kind of already went there, but oh, have you got any other yes. thoughts? Yes. My philosophy about a lot of things is bottom up. You look at the facts, you go on from there. Yes, mm -hmm. I think that consciousness, you have to define, of course, what you mean by consciousness, which I'll do yeah. in a minute, is the basis for everything. And the English language word consciousness is definable in many different ways. Some people say it's the same as awareness. No, not quite. For me, awareness is one aspect of consciousness. But I think that awareness is the key to why consciousness is fundamental. Because consciousness is fundamental, the awareness aspect is something that produces some impetus in some direction. And 
you see this played out in the whole millennia of evolution of life forms. And again, I don't have any agreement with what an English we call the creationists, the one who say that, well, God created everything, and he was behind all of the uh, evolutionary phenomena. No, that's too sub That's top down. I don't like top down explanations. Mm -hmm. I like the bottom up explanations. Yeah. And I, so I think you can make the case that if consciousness is fundamental. It's like consciousness is playing with itself. What can we produce? What new life forms can we produce that will make things interesting? And so in the whole course of evolution of very simple one-celled organism up to complex human beings and maybe beyond, we don't know, you have consciousness playing a role. And one thing I don't like about the top-down explanation is that it assumes that evolution is a straight path. No, it's not. Evolution has dips and turns, and sometimes it seems to be going backwards instead of forward, all in the service of survival. Evolution emphasizes survival of the organisms, and everything that's done is based on the survival. And that survival, I would maintain, springs from consciousness. Yeah. So you think it is probably non-local then? You think that's what the evidence suggests? It, it points to it being non-local, not a product of the brain? Well, as you know, non-local is a term that is being more frequently used in parapsychologists. It's sort of a neutral term. It gets away from some of the terms that, shall we say in English, have a lot of baggage, mm -hmm. like clairvoyance and telepathy and precognition. Yeah, they have a lot of baggage and a lot of... Uh, prejudices along with them. So to talk about non-local information, non-local perturbation, non-local perception, those are a little more neutral terms. Yeah. So, but you think, it, you think it is not a product of the brain? You don't think consciousness is a product of the brain? You don't think that's what the evidence says? Well, you can certainly make the case of consciousness coming out of the brain. It's just that I don't think, now here again, it depends on what one thinks is convincing. Mm -hmm. I can say, I can understand the rationale about the brain excreting consciousness, but I think a better explanation is that consciousness is fundamental and the brain, the human being, other life forms, non-life forms, that all of this is embedded in a sea of consciousness, a sea of intention and intentionality. Yeah, fascinating. Um, Stanley, do you think it's possible to learn or develop psi abilities? Or do you think it's just something you're kind of, you're born with? What are your thoughts on that? Well, again, there's a division of opinion with parapsychologists, and some of them have claimed that, yes, you can train people to use their non-local abilities. Well, I don't, now here again, it depends on what you consider evidence. I don't think the evidence is convincing that people can be trained. Mm -hmm. I think that psychic abilities, like other human abilities, are on a continuum. A few people having a great deal of non-local ability, a few people have virtually none, most people falling in the middle. So if you take some of the people who are falling in the middle and give them training, well, that capacity has always been there. It's just that they haven't had a chance to use it. Mm -hmm. So I think that rather than say people are learning to use their long local abilities, people are learning to use a capacity that's been dormant and latent all this while. Mm -hmm. So nothing new is coming to the occasion. They're using abilities that have already had, that simply they have had no reason to uh, fine tune into something that is scorable on a parapsychological examination.
Got you. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, what are your thoughts on whether we are we the only animal that has potential psi abilities, or are there maybe other? And I know this is quite speculative, but do you think there's a chance that another animal, a non-human animal, might have these abilities too? There's a new book just out on animal ESP, and I I say absolutely. There have been experiments in England by Rupert Sheldrake, for example, on dogs that can predict when their owner is coming home. Even if the owner comes at an unscheduled time, the dog Mm. goes to the window to wait. (laughs) Why dogs? Well, dogs co-evolved with humans. There's a very close evolutionary link between dogs and humans. And this is why dogs make such wonderful pets, such wonderful guards, such wonderful... uh, uh, Companions. Assistance to handicapped people, yes, they're wonderful. Mm. But there are also evidences of some sort of consciousness, some sort of intention with other life forms too. And when I said that there was a book about animal ESP, no, there's an article about that. No, I think a book could be written. But there are more and more articles about the topic. So I take that back. People go looking for a book. Nope, that's after look for the individual articles. The book that I was thinking about is Rupert Sheldrake's book about 10 experiments that you could do to advance science. And some of them were ESP tests. So, yeah, so that was the book that I was thinking of. I just didn't represent it too clearly. Got you. Well, I'll see if I can find any of those articles and maybe link them in the description along with all your books and things like that. Um, What are your thoughts on the survival, a potential survival of consciousness after bodily death? Well, as your, uh, your viewers probably know, an American millionaire, Robert Bigelow, mm-hmm. had a massive contest, and the winner got a half a million dollars. Yeah. And then he spent another million dollars for the runners up. And I've read several of those essays, and they pull together experiments that have been done over the decades. And again, to me, I think a very convincing case can be made that there is survival after physical death. Mm-hmm. I mean, there are experiments done with, so again, we use the word medium claimant. People who claim to be mediums, people who claim to be in touch with people on the other side, and they often are able to come up with information that they could not have gotten in any legitimate way. So all of these essays, all the prize winning essays are available on the internet. And so again, people who are debunking those claims, I would say, well, have you read even one of those prize winning essays? So again, if people want to make those debunking claims, they have to be informed. Yeah. And I think that There are researchers working right now who um, are continuing to refine the approaches that they use on this topic. And what was neglected by parapsychology for many, many decades is now a very strong and viable research interest and research discipline. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Again, your readers, your listeners might not know what we're talking about in terms of testing. Well, let's put it this way. There is a a procedure called uh, psychometry where medium will take an object that a dead person owned and hold it and do a reading on that person. And then this is compared with similar readings, similar objects that had no relationship to that particular pairing. And again, statistically significant levels, the medium claimants come up with information that was only known to the departed. So is this convincing? Well, there's an alternative explanation, of course. If consciousness is fundamental, maybe the medium is tapping into this sea of consciousness 
and coming up with that information. Well, does that count as survival? Well, it's a, maybe an interesting form of survival that when a person dies, his or her consciousness merges with that whole sea of consciousness, but maybe from time to time, it reassembles at the medium's claimant's intention to play this role in the psychometry experiment or some other experiment. Yeah. At this point, I know that many of your listeners might be baffled or just giving up saying, oh, good heavens, this is just too esoteric for me even talk about such thing. Well, I can understand that because we're not used to uh, this type of conversation, not used to this type of dialogue. But again, go and read the prize-winning essays. Which I think was Jeffrey Mishlove, right? The prize-winning Jeffrey essay. Mishlove won the half a million dollar prize. And I mean, his tour de force was really remarkable. He must have spent weeks, if not months, out of but he took some of the interviews that he's had with people who uh, have explored survival and gave his own rationale and then illuminated that with quotes from these other people. I mean, this was like making a full length motion picture. Yeah. And so, uh, of course, that won the contest hands down. Yeah, I think it's fascinating. And again, I'll link that the the essay in the description. And and I also I've, I read Leslie Kane's book Surviving Death, which I think is a fascinating and and very compelling. Oh yes, you know, it is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you've read that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's kind of by the end of it, I'm kind of finding myself accepting things that at the beginning I wouldn't have even considered. You know, it's a really wonderful kind of stairs. Is that book translated the French? Um, I would imagine so, but I'm not sure. But but my oh. my my listeners are going to be almost all English speaking. Uh, oh, that's fine. And I hope so because that's a very good book. Yeah, and the author yeah. did a lot of homework to produce it. Absolutely, that was yeah, a good yeah. choice for you. Yes. Yeah. No. I. I it, again, it it kind of began a shift in my brain. It's kind of changed my whole worldview. You know, if I can say that, it really has started me on a new journey, which opened me up in turn to psi phenomena, which I would have never considered before. So there you go. Mm -hmm. um, to, to kind of uh, another question here, slightly a little bit different. Um, but what are your thoughts on the current renaissance in psychedelic research? Well, you don't know this, but I was very much involved with psychedelic research back to the 1960s. And I did a chapter for a book on, called Psychedelic Art, mm -hmm. where I interviewed uh, dozens of psychedelic artists and did the theme analysis of what they had in common and what they produced in their art that was connected to their psychedelic experience. And so Again, I've been aware of the evidence for years. No, I have not done the experiments of psychedelics. I have supported people who have done, have done the experiments. And of course, I was dismayed when the U.S. government and most other governments put the clamp on psychedelics, especially LSD. And to this day, the Food and Drug Administration of the United States has LSD in the category, no redeeming value high potential of risk. Well, we know that's not so. And slowly, the attitude has changed in the United States. And now we're actually seeing psychedelic assisted psychotherapy becoming more effective than comparable psychotherapies, especially for things like depression, especially the use of psilocybin, which as you know, is uh, extracted from or synthesized from uh, the psychedelic mushrooms. And so psychedelic assisted therapy is off and running, not only in the United States, but other countries in the world too, especially in, in England. So I'm just glad that I lived long enough to see the times change. Yeah. And the emphasis now on controlled experiments really makes a convincing case as to the efficacy of psychedelic assisted psychotherapy. And it's important that a longitudinal study be done. How long does the effect last? I mean, some treatments for depression, people get out of their depression 
after one or two sessions of psilocybin, wow. rather than taking a pharmaceutical drug every day for the rest of their life to yeah. get out of their depression. Yeah. So the people come out of their depression, where are they going to be one year from now? And this is a good question. Maybe they have to come back for a booster shot after several months. This is why it's important that the people who have been studied be followed up longitudinally to find out what the long-term effects are of the psychedelic-assisted psychotherapy. Yeah. And of course, I actually have had experience in what anthropologists call the field, going to Mexico and interviewing Maria Sabina, who was the shaman who revealed the secrets of the sacred mushroom to a group of investigators from New York City. And she was written up in Life magazine. Uh, people descended on her little town. Uh, it was such a catastrophe. The government had to send in troops, Mexican troops, to clear the hippies and the curiosity seekers out of this little town because wow. they were simply uh, uh, polluting it with waste and mm. with... Um, paying money for mushroom, all sorts of terrible things were going on. So yes, I visited Maria Sibina long after that had happened and her town had come back to their uh, usual way of life. And it once again is a very humble, but very clean and very virtually crime-free little hamlet. And so I'm so glad I was able to visit her uh, before she passed on. And mm -hmm. uh, again, I have had the chance to uh, take ayahuasca in Brazil with the indigenous churches who have practiced ayahuasca sessions maybe for centuries for all we know. And ayahuasca is a very, very powerful psychedelic mm -hmm. made out of two different plants in just exact ratios. Now, the question is, how did the Indians hundreds of years ago know how to take one plant and combine it with the other in just the right dosage to produce an effect? And the Indians say, well, the plants told us. Well, that's as good an explanation as any, because anthropologists have not been able to come up with a better explanation. And again, if the universal if consciousness is universal and fundamental, well, exactly. maybe the plants did in some unusual esoteric way get information to the Indians. Wow. But in any event, it, there is now some very good ayahuasca research going on. And I've known about the ayahuasca since I was at Northwestern University, studying with my professor, William McGovern, who actually went to Peru and wrote a book about it and about what was called yahe, another word for ayahuasca. So I knew about this for decades before I actually was in Brazil and had a chance to take ayahuasca myself. And again, this has great potentials for therapy along with everything else. Of course, the Indians use it for religious and sacred purposes, which is fine. I just hope that they do, do not lose that orientation yeah. uh, as time goes on. So you don't think we'll ever put the, the psychedelic research, you don't think it will ever go back in the bag. You think that one is, is just going to continue to progress now? It's going to progress for a very simple reason. People can make money from it. Yeah. <laughs> if, if people could figure out a way to make money from remote viewing, it would be accepted by now. Yeah. No, it's too yeah. unpredictable. Yeah. Psychedelics are a little more predictable. For example, I predicted the legalization of marijuana back in 1977, before you were born. And I lived long enough to see that happen. No, yeah. marijuana is not completely safe. It has its drawbacks, but it should not be criminalized. Yeah, no. uh, I mean, for decades in my lifetime, people were going to jail. High school kids were going to jail for smoking or selling marijuana. At mm. least those days are now pretty much over with the United States. And again, as I keep emphasizing, marijuana is not without its dangers, but certainly less dangerous than alcohol, less dangerous than tobacco. 
Yeah. And people that use it have to be aware of those dangers and use it, shall we say, judiciously. And mm -hmm. of course, there are whole medical uses for marijuana right now. I use yeah. medical marijuana in gummy form, tablet form, for arthritis. Mm -hmm. And all of this is making money. And as yeah. I said, now that people are making money from marijuana, of course it's going to be legalized. Of course it's going to be available. Yeah, F follow the money, follow the evidence. That's um, right. That's right. If you can't, if you can't follow the evidence, at least follow the money and vice versa. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Let's change direction a little bit here, if you don't mind. I've got a couple of questions about UFOs, the U UAPs, um, whichever way we want to call them. Um, so these are actually questions from uh, Christopher Altman. I'm not sure if you're familiar with him, but he's a he's a quantum technologist, NASA trained commercial astronaut, veteran of multidisciplinary deep future research at the uh, Institute Star Lab, the Research Institute Star Lab. He's chief astronaut, technical officer at the Mars City Design director of special programs at UAPX and the Galileo Project uh, at Harvard University. And of course, most importantly, he's a friend of this podcast. Um, so he's got a couple of questions that he asked me to put to you. So first up, he wants to know, what is Stanley's perspective on the heightened sense of urgency, the increasing frequency of anomalous activity and reports of incursions into secure airspace from military and national governments on the topic of UAPs, with more activity coming out from the shadows into public awareness every day? Well, again, I am not a specialist on what is now being called in the United States unidentified aerial phenomena, but I've known about this for ages. And of course, even as a kid, I was fascinated by the stories that were coming out about UFOs, the famous Roswell sightings, for example, the famous Barney mm -hmm. and Betty Hill sightings, all of that. Yeah. And here's a case where I have, I simply had an open mind that didn't make my mind about it one way or another. And then when I was in New York City, I did have a very interesting experience. I was at a party with a woman by the name of Ruth Gage Colby. She was an outstanding activist in the United States in terms of championing unpopular causes. And she became very good friends with Senator Hubert Humphrey, who was a United States Senator from Minnesota, a very, very prominent Senator. And ran for Vice President, tried to get the nomination for presidency, he didn't succeed, but he would have made a very good president. The whole point is, she went into his office, and because she was a friend of his, they just escorted her into his private office and told her to wait. In the private office, she saw a folder on the desk, top secret. So of course she read it. <laughs> and it was about UFOs. And then the Senator Humphrey came in and said, Hubert, this is such exciting news. UFOs are real. They actually exist. Said, yes, I know they are, but we cannot tell the American public. They, they would be traumatized. They'd be horrified. So this gives a clue as to government cover, cover up. Hmm. Probably they thought they were doing this for the public's own good. Now, of course, that no longer holds. The public has been exposed to so much scandal. So many secrets have been unearthed on other topics that we don't have to worry about the public being traumatized anymore. Again, back when I was a kid, we had the famous Orson Welles radio broadcast of War of the Worlds. It was dramatization of that novel, which I had read. And every now and again, there was a pause for commercial breaks. This is back in the late 1930s. And believe it or not, Millions of people thought that the UFOs had landed. People were getting in their car and leaving the big cities. And it was not Orson Welles. He was a famous actor, producer, and director. Not his fault because there were commercial breaks. People ignored the commercial breaks and, oh, my God, they're going to be after us. It was panic. And it took a while, a couple of days for it to be uh, uh, settled down. Yeah, so I remember that, that that was fantasy, but Ruth Gage Colby got me interested in the possibility that this might be for real. Okay, so I hope that that 
give my best answer to that particular question. Yeah, that's that's a good answer. I've got another couple of questions on that on that topic, if you don't mind. From yeah. both both of these still from Christopher. Um, I was going to ask you about this topic anyway, but I thought Christopher's questions are a little bit more, you know, the cleverer than mine, a little bit more intellectual. So I thought <laughs> we'll roll with those. Um, he wants to know what your take is on this statement made by the director of the Russian space agency Roscosmos. Um, UAP have been here as long as humans have been on Earth. Our pilots say they often appear during initial test flights. I spoke to NASA about it, where some supporters think that humans may be subject to outside observation. I'd like to think so. So, yeah, what are your thoughts on that statement? Well, over the years, the Russians have been way ahead of the United States in terms of their reactions to UFO phenomena. And now, of course, with the Russian invasion of Ukraine, those communications are postponed maybe for decades. It's a shame mm. of how politics, military operations can uh, disrupt scientific communication. Tragic. Yeah. So all I can say is the uh, statement makes sense to me. And again, from my own experience, earlier this year, I went to Houston, Texas, Rice University is a major American university, and they have what they call the archives of the impossible. All of my professional papers are in the archives, and I went there for a dedication of the archives. Well, they also have all the archives of Whitley Stryber, who is an American who claimed he was abducted by UFOs and has been in contact with the UFO people or agencies ever since. And all of, and I met him for the first time. All, all of his papers are there, and all the papers of some other UFO investigators. And so during the dedication, I was able to hear presentations from some of them. And the dedication not only reached a couple of hundred people in the audience, but thousands of people who were watching it remotely. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, so Rice University has uh, performed a wonderful service in terms of archiving a lot of this material that would probably be lost if it had not been for their intervention. What did, do you know much about the Whitley Stryber uh, cases and, and his claims? Well, again, I have not read his most recent books. All I can say is that uh, he is convinced that he was shall we say, abducted, which is far of a crude word. We don't know, should know what was happening. Mm -hmm. Taken into a spacecraft. But there are dozens, if not hundreds, of other claims like this. Here's a point where I'm agnostic. Yeah. I'm agnostic about a lot of things, by the way. Maybe so, maybe not. Yeah, me too. But I, I don't really need to make a decision on it. That might interfere with me following the evidence. So let's just mm. see what facts keep coming in. Yeah. And UFO phenomena is the abduction phenomena is one of them. UFOs, yes, I think that the case is pretty well settled. There are unidentified flying objects of one sort or another for which there's no conventional explanation. Of course, most of the sightings can be explained. Maybe 90, 95% can be explained. It's yeah. that 5 or 10% that can't be explained, which are the topic of serious study now. Yeah, absolutely. In terms of the abductions, I, again, I, I, I agree with you. I'm, I'm agnostic to a lot of things as well. I think it's a good standpoint to have. Um, with the abductions, I think I, I believe that there, there are actually millions of cases of it, like at least reports of it. Um, so again, wh what that means, I don't know, but it, there's, a, there's a lot of reports. So um, yeah, again, th there's, there's smoke there. Um, in terms of what the UFOs are, that leads me on to this next question, um, which is what would be your kind of best guess hypothesis on the underlying nature of UAP, um, whether they are singular, multivariate, and manifold in nature? Well... Again, when you say millions of people, this is probably true. It's a sort of a statistical estimate. Mm, it's not yeah. that there are millions of written archives 
Yeah. But that's why Whitley Stryber's work is so important because it is archived. Mm. And in the future, people can look back on it and figure out how to make sense of it. Yeah. So in terms of uh, my own explanation, I think the big mystery here is how the agency, I like the word agency, in psychology and agency is something that has intention. And it's better than saying aliens or human-like beings. No, they're agencies, they're intelligences of one sort mm -hmm. or another. So maybe the intelligences don't need to travel by a craft. Maybe they can sort of think themselves to Earth. And then on the other hand, there certainly are reports of people describing crafts, and there are even chunks of metal, allegedly, from some of these crafts that have been analyzed. And on one of them, the analysis, well, this does not seem to be of human origin. So again, I don't have the time to do a worthwhile study of all of this. I just read what comes my way. Yeah. So all I can say, you can certainly make a case one way or the other, maybe both, whether these agencies are actually powering physical crafts or whether they're simply, by intention, willing themselves to visit Earth and then willing the abductees to come with them. See, the abductee phenomena could fit under either of these two models, the physical craft model or the uh, agency model mm -hmm. that doesn't yeah. require a craft. Yeah, that's interesting. I, when you say agency, um, I suppose you're talking. We're talking about a non-human kind of intelligence, right? Not not human. No, humans have agency also, of course. Agency is a psychological term. Was based on humans, of course. So yeah. agency is a very broad, broad term. Mm -hmm. But in this context, do you do you believe that at least some of these UFOs, there's a good chance they are a non-human agency yes i think there's a good chance they'd be my human agencies I, yeah I, it's, time it's will in, tell. absolutely and i think we are in a process of i think we're a lot more is going to come out i think we're in a process of that speeding up it was just really interesting what you said about that it could be kind of physical or, or potentially non-physical or both because i think john mack uh, dr john mack of harvard the the late john mack that went deep into this topic the abduction phenomena he kind of wrestled with the same the same concept he i think there was a while where he was convinced it was just nuts and bolts physical craft and then i think there was a while where he began to think it was maybe something in a kind of another dimension maybe not physical in our, our sense of understanding um and yeah he kind of i think he went a little bit back and forth and, and changed his views on it did you know john mack by the way oh yes i knew john Mack very well yeah. was devastated to hear of his mm. death that was stupid he was hit by a hit and run driver and i yeah. know what happens on those streets in england you're supposed to look both ways and then cross well that doesn't protect you against a hit and run driver that was so yeah. tragic that he lost his life in such a senseless way but on the other hand yes i knew john Nowak. i've read his book on the topic i knew of his back and forth explanation but he was utterly convinced that the people interviewed were abducted by alien agencies. Mm. Yeah, he's a, he's a fascinating man. I, I've spoken to Ralph Blumenthal, who's a former New York Times reporter. He wrote John Mack's biography um, mm -hmm. a year or two ago. And uh, yeah, so obviously I, I, I'm fascinated by the man as well. Um, I don't think I haven't got any more questions for you on UFOs. So unless is there anything else you want to share? Any other thoughts? Have you ever seen one? I was in Brazil where UFO sightings, of course, are very common. And I'll give you two examples. I was with a group of people with a tour group that I was leading, and we were having dinner, and out of the blue, somebody said, have you ever seen a UFO? I said, no, I think they're avoiding me. <laughs> An hour later, I had a phone call from another room, Stan, you've got to come outside. There's UFO in the air. So I ran outside, uh, went up to the top. Of, well, sure enough, there was this huge disc 
with colored lights flashing, and we just were watching it in fascination until it disappeared. Wow. Okay, I wrote this up. It got some publicity, and then somebody came up with a very good analysis. The night that I saw the UFOs, there was a celebration in a new bar town, a celebration during the Brazilian Carnival uh, holiday, mm -hmm. and some students had built a disc and floated it up in the air. And so this is probably what I saw. See, this is an example of getting more facts and then changing your mind when you have more facts available. Yeah. And, and the report also said there were no other sightings of UFO in Brazil, and the Brazilians would have been the first to come up with a sighting. So I think that was a good explanation. All of this, by the way, is written up in a yet-to-be-published book where I talk about this experience and how I uh, changed my mind with more information coming in. Yeah. Then the other experience I had in Brazil was with, I was with two friends, a Brazilian friend and a German friend, and we were visiting a spiritual community outside of the capital city of Brasilia. Now, outside the capital city, there are some spiritual communities that people have built, very, very poor people, and they've built them out of virtually nothing. The one I visited was actually visited by a female truck driver. And it became a haven for very, very poor people who felt at home there and who planted gardens, made their own clothes, and had a very viable way of living. Well, they actually meditated once a day in a little amphitheater that I visited. And our guy took me in one direction, my Brazilian friend in another direction, my German friend in another direction, and they played the recorded music. And in came these people from the slums. Now they were Lord this, Lady that, and they were dressed to the nines, as we say in English, dressed to their nines uh, with beautiful costumes. And they were praying and meditating for an hour and then they marched out, and I reunited with my two friends. First of all, I met my Brazilian friend. Dad, did you see the UFO? I said, no, I didn't see the UFO. I wasn't looking. I was like, oh, yeah, it was big. It was blue. And there was something peeking out of the window with a human-like head. It lasted for about 20 seconds, and poof, it disappeared. A moment later, my... German friend said, did you see the UFO? And I said to my Brazilian friend, not a word from you. I said, describe. It was big. It was huge. It was blue. A little window with somebody. Other. It lasted for about 20 seconds. So there are two corroborating views of the same thing, unless mm. they were in collusion to trick me, which I don't because they were in different parts of the uh, auditorium. Uh, Wow. So that, yeah, so that is more convincing to me than my own sighting, which yeah. I think which can be explained other ways. Yeah, well, yeah, that is, that's, that's very compelling. And like you say, if they were out to trick you, they probably would have told you that later on. Like, otherwise, yes. where's the fun in it? They would have had to say, Stanley, we got you. Um, yeah, wow, that is amazing. You see, I, the I, same... I, Go ahead, finish your sentence. I'll give no, you I, I was just going to say, I've never seen one, unfortunately, but that's, uh, that's boring. You tell me what you were going to say. <laughs> Well, in parapsychology, one has to be consciously aware of trickery. Mm. Now, I was well aware of this from the get-go, as we say in English, from the beginning, when I found out that the amazing Dunninger was a mentalist, not a psychic claimant. And so I've been on the lookout for ways of deception. All of our work in our dream laboratory we made sure that there was no possibility of deception, all sort of controls. We also had not one, not two, but three magicians come in and take a look at our research protocol. And they said, no, the only way cheating is possible would be if the statistics deliberately made the mistake. Well, our statistics were done by a university professor, not by a member of our staff. So we even ruled that out. So, 
there's also an element of trickster in psychic phenomena themselves. There's a wonderful book called uh, The Trickster of the Paranormal by George Hansen. Wonderful book about how a lot of psychic phenomena seem to have a trickster element. And it's, I think there's a lot of play going on in the universe. There's a lot of humor. There's a lot of stuff that we take too seriously, which is basically play. So now getting back to the story that I was going to tell you, a couple of years ago, I had an email from a woman in the state of Virginia who worked with the U.S. Army, and she helped plan events. And she did this in conjunction with a chaplain at the base. And she began to have strange dreams, mm -hmm. dreams about soldiers who were killed in some of the United States and ill-begotten wars like Afghanistan and Iraq, which weren't worth an American life, but let's yeah. get back to the topic. So anyway, uh, she got identifying information, took them to the chub. Yes, I knew him. I knew him when I was posted in Iraq. I knew him when I was posted in Afghanistan. And she was talking to these people in her dreams, people on the other side, so to speak. And they were saying, we just want to assure you that we're, even though we died at a very young age, we're here, we're happy, we're doing fine. We're moving on with our own development. Well, she was able to identify these people and sometimes she actually went to official army records to make sure they actually existed, and they did. And the chaplain vouched, and this kept on until he was sent to South Korea on a new assignment, and he, the two of them had to work together. She had the information, but he had the earlier information, and the two of them jived. So I wrote this up and had it published. I said, Yes, they could be playing a trick on me, but what was their goal? What was their purpose? And if they were playing a trick, this was been the time to embarrass me. No, that mm -hmm. never happened. So, and to play the trick, that involved a very complicated set of invention of these dreams. Why would they, through all the troubles, going through army records, trying to get details that should be conveyed in a dream, uh, tricky doesn't make too much sense. But nevertheless, I was aware of that. They had to put that out there as a possible explanation. Yeah, well, there's an important lesson there. And, and I think you're right in that, yeah, whether it's tricks or whether it's just that the, the everything is so much more complicated and confusing than we can possibly comprehend. I think yeah, it's, an, it's an amazing reality that we haven't yet discovered. Um, I'm going to let you go in a minute, Stanley, because I've taken up quite a lot of your time. But before I do, just uh, tell me, is there anything else that you wanted to to kind of highlight, whether it's in your work you've done or something, you know, psi phenomena, something else? Is, is there anything you wanted to say? Uh, yes, I think that one thing that I want to tell your viewers and listeners, if you have a psychic experience, don't think that you're going crazy. Now, it's true that some types of psychic reports are symptoms of mental illness. That's true. But those are reports that don't have a foundation, that don't have something in the everyday world to latch on to. If you dream about a loved one's death, or if you dream about a loved one's accident, or if you dream about some little minor thing, like giving a surprise gift of candy that comes true and it actually happens. No, you don't think you're doing crazy. This is part of your life. This is part of the human potential. We do have these possible uh, uh, events and they might be happening more often than we realize. Mm. If my, look, if consciousness is fundamental, uh, psychic passes are a part of that consciousness and so they're also fundamental and they probably enter into our day by dealings more than we realize now again the other side of that some critics are saying well if psychic phenomena really happened they would have been available to affect 
the results of psychological experiments and we don't see that happening. Well, of course you don't see this happening because you don't look for it. We know that there are very, very few, if any, complicated psychological experiences and events that actually can be repeated on demand. One analogy I often use, very few men can have an erection on demand. This depends upon a lot of other variables. Yeah. And so if they don't have an erection, they shouldn't be dissuaded. It's just very complicated phenomena. Same thing with psychic phenomena. No, you cannot produce them on demand, but if they happen, make the most of them, learn what you can, and don't think that you're going crazy. Yeah, that's a, that's a great metaphor. And I think there's probably been more research done on erections than on psychic phenomena, you know, like uh, oh, much, this more ex- <laughs> much more because that makes money. People with erectile dysfunction spend a lot of money, uh, 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 some of it's uh, very, very well spent, some of it waste of money. Yeah, because money is there. And yeah. as I keep saying, if psychic phenomena were making people money, the game would be over. Yeah, once there, they figure out how to do that. <laughs> there have been attempts, there have been attempts, but they're not reliable. Again, the trickster element enters and it's just too strong. Yeah. Um, but I think this is the challenge. Find some way, and I've been saying this for decades, that psychic phenomena can have a practical use that will allow people to make money from it. That will bring in the investment. And then a whole new chapter will begin. Most definitely. I fully agree. And and just to, for me to briefly say something, because you just made me think of it then. Um, I think I've heard you say previously that you're 99% sure that Sai is real. And again, that's good because you're just keeping that, you know, you never know for certain. It could, you know, But again, what I was going to say is that imagine how many yeah things that have occurred to people on that are alive now every everyday kind of occurrences that people put down to just coincidence or or what have you that may well in fact be side phenomena at play it may be that sixth sense or however however you want to call it um yeah it's just crazy to think how prevalent it may be but it's just mislabeled mischaracterized well i've been over the years very much influenced by the writings of carl gustav jung the psychoanalyst of Sicily, mm. and he posited the collective unconscious 100 years ago. And this collective unconscious is very similar to the notion of consciousness being fundamental. And so if there's a collective unconscious, of course, there can be coincidences. He called them synchronicities if they're meaningful coincidences. And these synchronicities cannot be dismissed as just a coincidence because mm. they have meaning to them. And the meaning is sometimes what can save a person's life, give a person a new direction, or be a matter of curiosity and dinner table conversation one way or the other. But again, don't simply brush these off. See if there's something you can learn from these coincidences. Yeah, absolutely. Well, wow. um, there's so much more we could talk about. We, we, I think we could talk for just hours and hours, but I'm, I'm going to call it a day there and, and let you get going. One last thing, I suppose, before I do, is just if there's a message, any advice, any words of wisdom you want to pass to people watching and listening. Well, I'm not a very good one to talk about words of wisdom because I've made so many <laughs> catastrophic mistakes in my life. Well, that, that's where the wisdom comes from. <laughs> uh, well, I would say think before you act and tell yourself, what are the consequences of this action? I'm very much in the here and the now and living in the present. Sometimes I go overboard and I'm so much involved in the present that I forget about the consequences of what I'm doing. And then I get into trouble. So I think we have to do both. It's a tricky dance. Yes. Don't look back, don't look forward, unless it serves your purposes to do so. I mean, to some extent, the past is always with us, but so is the future. And you have to navigate with some skill to live a worthwhile and productive life. Amazing. Yeah, no, that's that's great advice. It's, it, it's very important, if not challenging, to live live in the present sometimes isn't it but no thank you for that stanley and thank you so much for today i really really appreciate your time and you sharing all your experiences and memories and and, and knowledge with me and and everybody watching and listening this is this has been a real pleasure so thank you so much a pleasure for me to 
talk to you because you've done your homework. You're very well informed. And that always you. makes it worthwhile. Yes. Thank you, Stanley. That's nice to hear. Take care and, and all the best. I'll talk to you soon. Okay. Okay. Thank you again. Thank you for listening to my conversation with the legendary Stanley Kribner. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. Please check out the description for links to Stanley's books and to learn more about him. If you want to join us on our journey as we try to unravel the universe, please subscribe.